Hey there, Dave Politis, Can Add Missing Project. Got the Reddit edition for our video channel. And you can follow me at David Politis at Can Add Missing on Twitter. And you can buy my books at our sister site, nabigfootsearch.com. Go to the online store. NA, like North America, bigfootsearch.com. Unfortunately, a lot of people are still making comments that they're going to Amazon or eBay or some online source to purchase my books and you're getting ripped off. Um, 99, well, 90% of my books on our site are $24.99. The others are $29.99 versus $85 and $125 on Amazon. Don't do it. Uh, those are resellers. We don't sell there. Just wanted to put that up front. Um, I'm still here at YouTube, amazingly. Uh, I'm still looking for a video site in, that has similarities to Amazon without the uh, verbal restrictions. A uh, site that, where you can monetize, a site where you can speak freely, a site where you own your videos and once you upload, somebody else doesn't. And that's the big drawback at this point. I'll find one. And uh, when I do, you'll be the first to follow me at my own per missing persons website, Can Am Missing, like Canadian American Missing.com. So thank you. Uh, got a lot of really cool emails this week from people about morality. And many of you think, as I probably do too, uh, many people have lost their moral center. And it seems as though that with the advent of social media, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, it's free will and okay to go and attack people and say anything you want. I'm one of those people that doesn't believe that. And I think that uh, we all have to, ha have to have this moral center of gravity that balances us as a people. And you don't say something to someone that you wouldn't say to your mom or your dad to their face. And if you're willing to get that vulgar and you hate your parents that well, well then do unto others I you'd like do unto you. And uh, most of us wouldn't like that. As far as the comments lately on the Amazon reviews of my books, I found out who it was. A couple of you sent it in. It's a... Uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch podcast show and they wanted to attack me. I've never met anybody on that channel. They said that they've met me. I've never met them. That's a lie. And they've never had interaction with me, so that's a lie. And they decided that they wanted to attack me, which is one of the reasons why I left that Bigfoot Sasquatch world. There's a lot of people who don't have that moral sense or that moral responsibility. There's a lot that do but then there's some that don't respect many people. I've gone to a lot of Bigfoot conferences in my past and I get asked, uh, Dave, what's the difference between you and others? And I tell them that most of the people in this world don't, had, don't have the backing that I had when I entered that Bigfoot research arena, namely a couple of zillionaires that want to know the truth about the topic. And that's how I was able to do a super deep dive into Bigfoot and Sasquatch. There's, I would say, 95% of the people in the Bigfoot world that call themselves researchers. They've never done an ounce of research. It's a hobby. And they want to call themselves researchers. They've never contributed anything of value to the community. Um, they, they, in essence, degrade that arena so that the press, when they go in and they hear about a Bigfoot sighting and they go to one of these individuals for a comment and they say idiotic things and stupid things and then attack others, it makes the rest of that arena look like idiots and fools. And that has caused many people on the periphery of high intellect to stay away. Uh, namely, there's a lot of people in the academic community they don't want to be attacked. They don't want to be called names. They don't want to be insulted. Yet they're interested in the research. I know this because I know some of them. 
And the reality is, is that as long as these people, it's almost like they're a paid attack group or groups that are out there and they stay in the community and they want to have a vocal, a vocal sense of themselves. So they attack all kinds of people and they try to make fun of them. They try to insult them. They try to demean them, even though they have contributed nothing of value. And that's really the, it's really the sad note to the Bigfoot world because when people actually do have a sighting, they don't know who to trust, who to go to, who's going to treat them respectfully, who's going to make fun of them. Yeah. But uh, I do know because of a couple of you that sent me in the communications coming off this podcast to prove that it was them that did it. I'm not going to give them an ounce of credibility or publicity. I won't bring up their names. If it gets out of hand, then I'll give it to you guys and you can go at them. But uh, as of right now, they're not worth my, my conscience. I've got enough issues. Um, got a lot of really good emails. Now stop. Before you check out and all you want to hear is missing person stories, if you're of high intellect, you know that what I read correlates to missing people. And if you're turning away, it's because you're not looking inside yourself for true meaning and understanding. And if you just want to be entertained, get off the channel. Just leave. I'm here to educate you guys. This isn't an entertainment hub. I don't have super high-end audio visual or and i'm not into that i'll do that for the movies but if you're looking for that and you're looking for entertainment go elsewhere now for the intellectuals that are still staying here here we go i've said this before in an earlier video to watch an x-files episode called detour d-e-t-o-u-r and I was a big X-Files fan. And I remember watching this when I watched it again a couple months ago. And a lot of people don't know that the X-Files was filmed almost entirely in British Columbia. Their studios were in Vancouver. So when you see the environment that they film in, it's all around that area. And British Columbia has some of the most insane, unusual disappearances I've ever written about in Missing 411 Canada. So to see how some of the writers maybe came up with some of the material, I kind of get it. Now, Chris Carter, the executive producer of the show, was brilliant, put it together in a really, really good way for the first three or four years. And then after that, they made a joke of it and they took it away. But his first years were really good. Detour. You'll see why when you watch it. First, first email. Dave, I watch your videos with a somewhat horrified fascination because I see so many paranormal possibilities. I haven't written in about many of the things I get because I don't, I can't prove most of them. So it would only open heated debate and give you another cause for nasty write-ins and you don't need that. I don't expect that you will read this letter aloud, although you can if you wish. I just wanted to give you and perhaps others another area to research and speculate. Well, surprise, I'm reading it. That being said, I'm gifted and have a different outlook on what is going on around us. I'm clairvoyant and a life medium. I consider myself a healer and can speed healing and stop pain when I work on people. I don't accept money for using my gifts as I consider them a gift from God to people and God pays me for my time. <clears throat> That should erase any skepticism about my motives as I don't prosper from them. That isn't my main reason for writing today, but if you, Dave, are curious, please feel free to contact me. I said all that to say that when I hear or see something that is important, connected, something even more important, it jumps out at me like a 3D. All these 4-1 cases do. I don't have the missing puzzle pieces yet, but since they are coming. For the last couple of years, I find articles in YouTube about a boy from Russia 
From a young age, he could stand upright. He was known as a healer, and when he was old enough to talk, he spoke with visitors in their home. And soon there was a revolving door to see him about things. Some people considered him a saint and a prophet. He was able to accurately answer questions put to him by the throngs of visitors that came to visit. He was investigated by the Russian Orthodox Church and found to be legitimate, almost saintly. There were several women that took it upon themselves to write down his predictions and answers. Their writings are the source of numerous videos about his life. He accurately told people that he would die from an unknown, unknown cancer type illness at age 10, leukemia, and insisted on going on to a specific hospital so he could cure other children before he died. He died at home in March of 93. In a nutshell, the things he said about the future included predictions about portals opening up all over the world. He told several people that dinosaurs would start popping up around the world so God would prove to scientists that his Bible is correct, that the earth isn't more than a few thousand years old, and that God is in charge. The last couple years, we're seeing stories about the world about cryptids and dinosaurs like creatures, werewolves, megalodon, cellia camps, nessies, dire wolves, etc. Otrok said that portals would open and creatures from other dimensions would emerge and retreat through them. He described to one woman that a man would, was sitting on a stump in the woods, feeling as if he was being watched and a raptor, this was before Jurassic Park, so the, wind, the name wouldn't be a parallel, leaned through a portal and snatched him back through it. So many of the things he described would have come true if I thought you might want to watch a couple of the YouTube videos about them. If the portals are opening, as he predicted, and I sense there is a something to it, it might explain some of the disappearances. A person walks along a trail and steps through a portal to a different time. Your advice to leave exactly as you got to the spot where you sense you're in danger is very, very good advice. Dave, I've written before and tried to tell you about two men I met in SoCal that worked for the government on a program opening portals. I was told that they are ordered by the powers to be to open portals to a time period that the incredibly rich can move to a cleaner earth and start over. I know there is something to that. As they were telling me about it, something popped out of my mouth, as it does when in a psychic, I'm just as surprised as everyone else to believe me. The one guy stood up and fled in panic. Of course, there was more to the story, laughing out loud. There's something very real about these portals. I am from Montana and have lived in the area you are now. I sure loved it up there, but sold my place because my daughter is in hell on it is in a city and is slowly dying and I want to spend as much time with her as possible. I have so many comments about other things that stood out and write to you about it. Just leave for later as I felt that info about Otrock would be enough for now. Take care Dave. I understand your frustration about the phony bad reviews. Please know in your heart that the understanding and wisdom is a gift from God. Any person that doesn't have grace in their souls wouldn't understand it anyway. A person with grace will look at them and know immediately they are trolls and ignore them. Just focus on that info that the books are available inexpensively on your site and release it to God to handle them. You can't fix stupid and you can't change anyone else. Not what they think, do, or say. All you can do is change your thinking and actions and move on with the grace of God, a supporter that truly cares about you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Next story. Hello, Dave. I'm a lifetime Oregon Coast resident, former Marine. Happy Veterans Day, by the way. As well as an extremely avid outdoorsman. I also spent more than 20 years as a timber faller and over 30 years as a logger in general. Almost every day of my life I've spent in the outdoors as a lover of all things fishing and hunting. I also gold mine, rock hound, shed antler hunt, pick berries, etc. I'm a loyal villager. Thank you. Welcome, village. And as I find your research and subject matter very compelling, I must admit that I've been a skeptic of cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, and strange phenomena all my life. That changed about 12 to 15 years ago when I set out alone to hunt the Salmonberry Canyon up the Nehalem River. My plan was to hike several miles up the abandoned railroad track, set up camp, and hunt the opening weekend of deer season. 
After I got off work the Friday before the season opened, I rushed home, got my gear, and drove up the tracks and excitedly began my trek. It was late in the afternoon when I loaded with provisions, began hiking the canyon. It was a beautiful sunny day and all went as planned. When I had hiked approximately four miles up the track, I found an adequate campsite and set up for the night while utilizing the last bit of daylight to do so. During that time of the year, fire season was still in effect, so a campfire was out of the question and I only had a manual light. When darkness set in, that's when things got weird, to say the least. After a bite to eat and realizing that being alone miles from civilization, civilization might have been a little extreme, I decided to just go to bed early, forget about some things and strange noises that I had already heard throughout the evening, and hopefully be good and rested for opening day. The sounds only began to escalate from that point. I ended up hearing an array of unexplained noises from whispering to outright talking. I also heard walking in the grass multiple times, and we are talking right by my tent. Only to find when I would open my tent or window and quickly shine my light, nothing was there. I was terrified. And believe me, ex-Marine loggers don't frighten very easily. Now this is where Missing 411 plays a role. At the time, I didn't know what to think, only that while it was happening was the scariest part of my ordeal. While frozen in fear in my tent, I listened to what I believe the exact same noises that the gentleman recorded at the Sierra camp on Missing 411 The Hunted. The first time I watched your movie, my, floor, uh, my jaw hit the floor. It was unmistakable. The strange noises ceased completely at dawn, and that's when I packed up my stuff and got the heck out of there. I've never been back, and I've kept to myself about this for the most part, and I've described this to no one. I've just stated that I was a pretty scary camping trip by myself, and I never run into any details. Since then, I've, been a, I've seen an aircraft I couldn't identify with my wife, and what I believe to be a full-bodied apparition, and when you know it, my wife and I experienced the tuning fork that Mr. Morehouse described. I'm not sure that we will ever find the answers, but thanks to your research, more and more of us are listening, Dave. Thank you. Stay strong. Sincerely. And I asked, I asked this man on a follow-up email if there were any tracks in the grass when he woke up. He said no. But he did find a green apple on the trail right outside his tent, almost in the middle of the trail, that was a, had a very small bite out of it. He said that there were no orchards near there, and it was strange to find that in that location. Pretty weird. Now, why I read you that. In several Missing 411 books, I chronicle people that have vanished from campsites where the middle of the tent was pushed down. One of those was in Glacier National Park, and one of those was in Alaska at a national park. Now, the question I think about is what if something was pushing down on the tent from the outside. Would that cause us inside to jump out? And if you jumped out, could something bad have happened? I've had many people tell me that they've been camping in remote locations and heard footsteps, bipedal type footsteps, outside their tent. Heavy, sometimes so heavy it was shaking the ground. And the instances that I've talked to those people about, they were afraid to even look outside. There's been also times where strange shadows have been seen on the outside of the tent in the moonlight. Uh, in Missing 411, The Hunted, <clears throat> Ron Moorhead talked about a lot of these sounds that they heard over time. And in fact, on my website, I have uh, Ron's CD that he made up that had a lot of these sounds. And they're pretty good. So uh, you could look for them. They're on a CD on our site. Or you can watch the movie for free, Missing 411, The Hunted, on YouTube Movies. Also, our first movie, Missing 411, is on YouTube Movies. Next letter. Dave, I'm a Native American born in the Tinglet village of Clay Claywalk on the Prince of Wales Island off the coast of southeast Alaska. 
a den there. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. I listened to your program today and you said if your listening audience had an odd experience, you wanted to hear of it. I have a theological degree. I've been a missionary since 71. I don't do drugs, nor do I have a record. And I'm 76 years old and good mental health. Congratulations on being a good person and doing good things for your life. I appreciate that. Briefly, here's a few of my odd experiences. In 49 or 50, I was walking with my grandmother to visit a family from Edna who had been having encounters with what my people call the Kushtaka or Bigfoot. The Kushtaka had been intimidating this family in the middle of the night, so some of the men in our village put some kind of powder on the ground and then took plaster Paris prints of the footprints that they were approximately three times the size of a man. I saw them. While walking to Edna's house, suddenly we heard a long, very loud, ferocious roar, and when we looked in the direction of the sound, we saw a huge, black, hairy creature similar to a gorilla, but much larger, perched in a tree looking at us. While violently shaking the branches, continuing to make loud sounds. I felt my grandmother's strong hand squeeze mine, and then she yelled at me, run Florence, run to Edna's house and don't look back. I bolted, I didn't look back, and shortly my grandmother arrived safely. During the years I lived in Claywalk, we continued to hear reports from other villages along the coast about this foul-smelling Kushtaka. In 2017, I was traveling cautiously by car on a narrow mountain road just above Jasper, Arkansas. It was 4 a.m., very dark outside, and because the road was winding down a mountain, I wanted any oncoming traffic to see me clearly, so I clicked on my high beams. And the second I did, this flying creature swooped down low and flew directly in front of my Lincoln Town Car. Apparently, I startled it, hit it with the high beams. This creature was one solid color like military green of the Israeli army. It had a bald head and the body of a man. Its massive wings reminded me of ocean stingrays. I could not see its feet. My vehicle is large and wide, and I estimate this hybrid was twice the size of the width of my car. And we have large eagles in Alaska, but this bird's wingspan was massive compared to their wings. In February 2020, I was living in Juneau in an apartment approximately one and a one and a half miles from Bartlett Hospital. This rings a close bell to me. It was very close to the area where you, Mr. Politis, reported that two women with medical degrees who had gone missing in Juneau. One was never found, and the other one was found deceased by the river. Cause of death unknown. I digress. Back to my story. In my apartment, I was wakened at 2 a.m., got out of bed, and looked out my living room window, and to my shock and awe, I saw a very large UFO hovering just above the mountaintop. The mountain was only at about 1,200 feet, and the base of the mountain was about 1,000 feet from my win living room window. It was close enough to see blinding lights coming from its windows. The craft was at least three times the size of a Home Depot building. It was oval in shape with a dome. Around the belly and around the circular dome were very large, perfectly spaced round windows that were fully, fully lit up. After my initial shock, I went back to my bedroom and returned to look out my window and it was still there hovering over the trees and the treetops. I don't know if it was my sixth sense or I was looking for into the fifth dimension, but I had the sense that whatever or whoever was operating this massive UFO knew I was looking at it. So I prayed and it slowly moved back towards over the mountain and disappeared. Mr. Politis, I've watched your programs with keen interest and hope you will find the key to this mystery. I also know about your son, Ben, and I'll continue to pray for your comfort when I see you are struggling. Thank you. Appreciate that. Alaska. Been there. And I know that they have a lot of UFO sightings. They have a lot of everything kind of sightings. And they have a lot of water on the land and around them. <clears throat> Next letter. Watching your video of November, 20, uh, November 10th of 2021, you said if anyone had been hiking and experienced strangeness, you wanted to know. I live in Utah and quite frequently spend a lot of time in the high Uinta Mountains. I have seen and heard more strangeness, strangeness than I care to admit. But one day in particular struck with me. 
My daughter and I were hiking the Yellow Pine area along Mirror Lake Highway. The first half of our hike was uneventful, warm summer air, a breeze rustling through the trees, and a few birds. On our way back down the mountain, we heard what began as a low rumble. It was not an earth tremor, but you could feel it in the air. It was heavy and stifling. The birds stopped chirping and the wind stopped. We quickened our pace, and as we walked, the noise grew in both intensity and volume. This went on for a good 30 minutes as we hurried toward the car at the trailhead. As we neared the car, the rumble began to slow and dissipate as though it was heading off into the distance. There was zero air traffic and little, if any, road noise. When we reached the car, the thing would not start. It was as though the starter had gone out. I tried several times for about 30 minutes or so, wiggling wires and checking connections under the hood, but nothing. The car was dead. After try, try, <laughs> After trying everything I could think of, we sat by the car hoping to see the ranger drive by, had our lunch, and about an hour later decided to try one last time. The car started. Thank goodness. Because we had not seen one single car the entire time, and hiking to the ranger station would not have been a viable option, I don't know what the rumble was, nor do I want to know. I just know we were in danger and alone in the forest. We now carry personal locators every time, as well as a sat phone. Somebody's listening. Thank you. Some people make uh, comments about personal locator beacons. There's thousands of stories of people saved by those personal locator beacons. Thousands of stories. So don't try to tell me they don't work. I personally don't know of an incident where somebody activated them and the locator beacon didn't work. I don't know any of those, but I do know of a story and I've talked about it before in Idaho where a man activated his uh, locator. They went to the spot and he wasn't there. He was never found, but the locator beacon went off. Okay, today I'm gonna talk about three stories and they all revolve around missing 411 a sobering coincidence how did I get on to the stories about water related disappearances and almost everybody in that book was found in water so there's a man uh, named detective Gannon from New York PD and he was a missing persons detective. And he was m started to follow some unusual things that were happening with people found in water. They'd, found, they'd disappear in one part of the city and they'd be found upriver in water. It didn't make sense. Or the time in the water didn't match the time they were gone. And <clears throat> they ended up making a short series about what his team was doing and they call it the smiley face killers. People always ask me, well, Dave, is that what really your book's about? So let, I'll explain. I have never found a smiley face in any of the locations I've ever worked. Sorry. Do I think Gannon has done tremendous work? He's done tremendous work. He developed the saying, local reports for local consumption. And I'll give him credit for that. I use that statement a lot. And whereas his team was looking at it from a specific regional point of view, I knew I had cases from all over the world that matched what he did. Meaning people disappear after they've been drinking most of the time and somehow they get into a body of water and somehow they die. Nobody ever sees them get into the water. There's never any suspects and there's never a sexual assault and there's never any how can i say it <clears throat> bullet holes stabbings wounds to the body associated with an attack so when i wrote this book i didn't write about anything gannon did but i did write about him because if you take what he did in, in New York City and you expand that out to 
several other countries I've written about where these exact same things are happening. You got to say, wow, point of separation, water, many times an unknown cause of death. <clears throat> and when coroners do an autopsy, they all do it and they screen for 24 drugs and narcotics. It's like the same everywhere. And there's hundreds of drugs and narcotics you could search for, but they've coordinated down to just 24. And what happened in Wisconsin is a family had their young son disappear. I write about it in the book. And the coroner comes back. We don't know what happened. We're not sure, blah, blah, blah. So they paid for a second autopsy, which is about $2,000 or less. And in that second autopsy, the pathologist took more blood and urine samples and screened for a wider variety of drugs and narcotics. And he found that there was a massive amount of GHB in the body. Well, GHB in large doses can put you into a comatose state, but you know what's happening to your body, meaning that you can't really fight back and if I stick you in a body of water and you have high doses in your system, you're going to drown. And drowning is also associated with many of these cases. But in almost every case where there's a drowning verdict, the person could swim really well. So it didn't make any sense either. Now, I wrote the book, Ben was playing hockey, and I was on the East Coast watching one of his games. And during the day, I, I really, at that time I was writing most of the time while he was taking his nap. And that's what hockey players do before game time, they take a nap. And uh, <clears throat> a corner from a jurisdiction on the East Coast, a very large, large jurisdiction on the East Coast, called and asked me to have lunch. I said, sure, I met with him. And they said, Dave, the book was brilliant. And you outline exactly what we know has been happening for years. And it bugs the heck out of us because we get these bodies in and we can't figure out the cause of death many times. And we should because we're scientists. Now let's stop right there. You get these people that attack my work. <clears throat> they say, oh, you know, he exaggerates, he does this, he does that. Well, when you get right down to it, the people that are in the trenches, no, I don't exaggerate. They know I'm telling the truth and they know I'm leading to something. This corner said, Dave, keep doing what you're doing because you need to educate the rest of the corners out there and pathologists to start screening for more drugs. <clears throat> now, the reason they don't screen for a wider variety of drugs is, is expense. Each drug to screen costs more money. Sometimes a coroner's group in a large city may do 20 or 30 autopsies a day times hundreds of dollars, that's a lot of money. Whereas the coroners and the pathologists are on the staff, all of those testing has to go outside <clears throat> and cost some money. That's why they don't. But they need to be testing for GHB, especially in every case where a young person, specifically a young male under 30, is found in water. Now, just recently, between October 26th and November 7th, there was a run on these type of cases. And trust me, I'm on this, I'm watching, I'm paying attention, and it bugs the heck out of me what's going on because it is directly related to what I'm doing. Now, in Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, there's a map on the back of the book. And I'm not going to show you the map, but I'll show you this. And these are some of the cluster areas of missing people that I wrote about. Washington, D.C., New York City, and up the coast of Massachusetts and Boston. The Boston area had a huge influx of missing up around Toronto area, up along the northern part. 
And then Chicago has a history of these things happening. Milwaukee and Madison and around the universities in Wisconsin. This was a big, big deal for about 14 years. It kept happening and kept happening and kept happening. And then Minneapolis. And then there's other clusters in the western part of the U.S. Now, when it was happening at university towns in Wisconsin, uh, the local police chief tried to quell everyone and say, oh, you know, this is nothing big. They're all unrelated. Just completely lied to the audience. And the parents were smart. They knew he was lying. They called him out and had a new riot. It was in an auditorium. It was amazing. Congratulations, parents. Standing up for your rights and tell, calling out BS when you know it's BS, right? Yeah. So, nothing was ever solved about that, but police shouldn't lie to the audience. Just tell them the truth. But police don't like admitting that they don't have answers. And that is the truth. So, I'm going to talk to you about the three cases that are directly involved into what I just explained to you. And uh, first case happened October 26 this year. Oribi Kontine, a Nigerian man, 26 years old, a graduate student at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, he had lived in the States since 2017. He had a degree in criminology. All of his friends said he was a really good person, good soul, dressed very fine, treated people very well. And he liked to go to the beach to meditate. Well, he had a 2016 black Toyota Corolla. And on the 26th of October at about 3.30 in the afternoon, he parked it near 31st and Beach in Chicago. And again, people said this wasn't abnormal for him. He'd go there, sit on the lake shore, meditate. Well, during the time he was meditating, his car got broken into and some things were stolen. And then he disappeared. And I think the police have tried to put together the burglary with him disappearing. And they could only do that for a short period of time. On November 4th, his body is found at the 3500 block of South Lakeshore Boulevard on the water's edge. And <clears throat> there's a autopsy, cause of death, inconclusive, pending their blood and urine screening. That was case number one. Didn't get a lot of press in Chicago, but it didn't get by me. One thing I want to implore on people, when a coroner, well, first of all, Chicago, the coroner's division, <laughs> big experienced group, big and experienced. They've got a lot of coroners. And these groups, these coroner's groups, they have meetings all the time, discuss things. To not list a cause of death is not normal. Now, if he had stab wounds, gunshot wounds, bruising, if he got beat up, you don't understand the cause of death. But there's no cause of death. So at some point, well, no, hopefully, if the Chicago press keeps pushing for answers, and a lot of these cases take back seat to all the shootings and killings in Chicago. So, next case, Inaki Baskaran, 23 years old, missing October 30th of this year. He was drinking in Chicago. Yeah, another Chicago case. So he disappeared four days after a Arrivi. He was drinking at a bar called Celeste, with friends, stepped outside, and then the bouncer said there was no room, he couldn't get back inside. 
So he texted his friends and he said his battery was just about out and that he was going to walk back to their room in Wrigleyville, about four and a half miles away. When I read that about the battery going low, yeah, we all have cell phone batteries that go low. That's not abnormal. But I'm always thinking, because a lot of times in a lot of the cases that I write about, engines go out, batteries go dead. Just saying. I'm paying attention. Well, he's last seen at about 11.30 on October 30th. He had a degree in economics. He's a smart young man. His parents were very vocal when he went missing. Big search. And people started to get mad because all of a sudden, now you have two people within a short period of time that went missing. So, Oribi, Oriki, went missing. This is the young man. Good soul, found on the beach deceased. Inaki, this is missing poster. In the Celeste River North. He was last seen at 11.30 on October, on, uh, October 30th. The next morning, they were still getting texts. That's where you're seeing Halloween night. But uh, 5'9", 165, Caucasian, 23 years old. So his body is found November 5th at 4.53 p.m. on the south part of the Chicago River, near 1,000 block of South Wells. And what's really weird to me about this, and <clears throat> it's found six days after he disappears. If the body was in the river for six days, it's a good chance it had lividity. That's the settling of blood to the lower portions of the body. Gravity settles the blood, rigor mortis, and it should show significant signs of being in the water for that period of time. Yeah, that's right. But when he's pulled out, he's just described in articles as being unresponsive. That tells me that there weren't a lot of positive signs of death. And they were curious because he must have looked fresh. The body must have looked fresh. But they did pronounce him dead at the scene. The coroner stated, Death was inconclusive, and they were waiting more chemical analysis, just like Ariki. So you have point of separation on both cases. You have water, and in Anaki's disappearance, you have him drinking alcohol, which in the vast majority of the cases I wrote about in Missing 411, a sobering coincidence, Many, the vast, vast, vast majority of all the men I've written about were drinking alcohol before they disappeared. But again, folks, nobody ever sees them enter the water. Nobody ever sees them get in a fight. Very odd. Now, the third case. Well, before we leave Chicago, let me, let me show you this. This is important. So, here's this is the lake. This is the Bar Celeste. That's where Anaki was drinking. Now, there's a branch of the Chicago River that comes out. And a lot of people think it flows into the lake. It actually flows this way. And his body is found here, six days later. Now, Mr. Contine is found just a few blocks away in the lake from where he went to meditate, just maybe a couple hundred yards away. For him to be found so close is very odd. Very odd.
Now, Chicago is not a place that surprises me for these cases. I've written about many cases in Chicago in the past. And I know there's a lot of death and destruction in that town. But there's a lot of really, really weird stuff that goes on in Chicago. That it has an association with water. People not seeing anybody go in the water. How do they get there? Wrote a story in the book. Man was last seen with some friends drinking. And they're watching him on a CCTV. All of a sudden the camera turns to watch another area. He's never seen again. He's never seen again on other CCTV cameras that were picking, should have picked him up feet away. It's just gone. Yeah, odd. The next case in dates. So, Mr. Contine disappeared October 26th. Four days later, Inaki disappears. And now, eight days later, on November 7th, Garrett Walker disappears. First two cases were in Illinois. Now we're going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and a young man named Garrett Walker. This is the wanted poster put out by Garrett, for Garrett by his family. He went missing November 7th, 2021, 15 in the morning, drinking in town, town Tuscaloosa. He's a junior at the University of Alabama, majoring in aerospace engineering, pilot. He was from Mount Airy, Maryland, described as a super smart kid. He excelled in baseball when he was in high school and had an opportunity to go to college on a baseball scholarship turned it down to go towards academics. He was also a pilot and he had twin brothers and a sister. He was a member of the Delta Chi fraternity. Well, that's Saturday. He attended a University of Alabama home football game versus LSU. He was last seen at the Gray Lady Bar at 1.15 a.m. on November 7th, early in the morning. Now, it was a half a mile from the bar to a river. And his cell phone was found the following day on the river walk. Hmm, how did he get there? Well, after he was last seen at 1.15 a.m., he disappeared. Parents got involved, huge search, blah, blah, blah. Same old story. Well, <clears throat> the first day of the search, they find his cell phone and they also find some of his clothes, which they don't describe, but they find them some near the river walk, some in the river. Well, that tells me that something happened before he got in the river. Well, they knew he was in the Black Warrior River. That would have been pretty obvious at that point. And they put in divers. And on November 9th, two days after he was last seen, divers find Garrett. Remember, McGannon said in New York, local reports for local consumption. Here you have point of separation again. You have intellect and you have drinking alcohol. And at this time, they have not released of cause of death of Garrett. doesn't surprise me. In these cases, in Wisconsin, when they happened to these university communities and they were happening in numbers, the police again tried to step in and call the community, hey, this all isn't related, don't worry about it, They're, because the community thought there was a serial killer involved that was doing something to the kids. They were smart. The public could put it together but the police couldn't. Now, here is Tuscaloosa and the, the areas of what happened. So, Garrett's last seen here in downtown area. The river walk area is right here. There's a dam right here on the river. 
So no, there's no body that's going to get down here. And this part of the river is very slow moving. So if a body went in, it should have stayed right where it was at or very close. And they did find it and they haven't released any other details other than some of his clothes was on the river walk and some were in the river. That's a picture of Garrett and his mom. No cause of death yet. Now, would it surprise me if all of these cases came back with the cause of death being alcohol related or high, high amounts of alcohol? No. Wouldn't surprise me. Kids are out drinking. Yeah. Would it surprise me that cause of death was drowning? No. Now, if anybody out there knows the Walker family, the Bascaran family, the Contine family, got to get on the corners to test the body for GHB. Got to. Now, <clears throat> just so you people, if you don't know, the human body does produce GHB in minute amounts, very small amounts. Now, GHB is known around the world as the date rate drug. You can put it in somebody's drink and make them lose conscious, well, almost lose consciousness and be very susceptible to rape. These men were in a drinking environment, but somehow or another, they got from the drinking environment into a river or lake and drowned. Now, Mr. Contine was not in a drinking environment. He's one of the three that was not. But in every one of the cases that I wrote about in this book, people were. Now, in the UK, United Kingdom, We've had many of these cases, a lot of these cases. In one city in particular, they called the suspect the pusher because it seemed like people were getting pushed into these canals and dying and drowning. <clears throat> Problem is, some of the areas they were pushed into, the water was maybe a foot or two feet deep. They could stand up in it, but they drowned and died. Just like many of the people I wrote about in the books, they found water, bodies of water that were very shallow. So how do they get in these bodies of water is the million dollar question. One story in sobering coincidence is one of these young men woke up in a river flowing downstream. He says he doesn't remember getting in the river, doesn't remember being cold even though it was middle of winter, there's ice everywhere in the river. He's lucky enough to pull himself out of the river a block away from a hospital. He has no idea what happened. Just woke up there. Well, what's happening? You can't tell me that this is unusual. In all of the cases in the United States, there's never been a suspect named. Yeah, very strange. Well, this coroner I met with on the East Coast, she said, Dave, you need to come out and you need to make a presentation at our coroner's conference about this and wake people up. And uh, she gave me the name and address and she goes, you got to apply, you got to apply. And I applied. I didn't get into the conference. They said they were full. But point being, if you're a physician and you know other physicians that are coroners, pathologists, tell them to start studying GHB on these water-related deaths and start screening for it, please. And if you know the Garrett Walker family or the Baskerin family, tell them to check for GHB. And I gotta say it, because someone's gonna go out and buy it on Amazon or eBay or somewhere, $24.99 at my site. I think it's like $74 on Amazon. Same book. All my books are still in print. Um, I have great compassion for all these families that have lost these sons. Uh, they were good kids. And uh, we lost people.
people that would really benefit our world. And uh, I don't make light of it at all. It's very sad. Friends, we just hit a milestone of 325,000 subscribers. YouTube has slowed down my growth by about 80% in the last two weeks. I can look at the analytics. And my email traffic is up about 30%. So that doesn't seem right. But uh, as I've stated before, please keep your emails to just a paragraph or two, not long ones, short ones. I get a lot. <clears throat> I'm trying to get to as many as I can. If I don't get to yours, I'll eventually read it sometime. Don't send videos. Just say, this will be interesting to you. No. If you're going to send me a video link, put a timestamp on it. Tell me exactly why you want to watch it. Otherwise, it'll go to the back of the stack and I have about 500 videos I'm supposed to be watching. So I may never get to those if you don't put that timestamp and explain. We are this village. <coughs> this is important because my team can't solve this on their own. We need help. And out there in the community, I know there's a group of physicians that watch. There's a group of physicists that watch. There's a lot of education that surround this channel. Put your mind to it. Start thinking about what in the heck is going on here. It needs to stop. And whether I'm the one that gets stopped or these incidents stop, the more exposure we give it, the more lives we can save. And if you have a, a young person that's in college or that likes to go out drinking, tell them to stay in pairs. Don't, don't be separated. The same thing I say on, on, tra on trails. Don't hike alone. Don't leave a bar and hike through the city alone. Don't. All these cases I've talked about in sobering coincidence, people all were alone when this happened. Point of separation. So, and it's okay to go out and, yeah, I, I, when I was a young person, I did the same thing, went out, but I didn't get rip roaring drunk. I, I could take care of myself and I, and I knew what my surroundings were about. Try to implore upon young people to do the same thing or don't drink. Anyhow, I'll keep plodding away here for you and I'll keep trying to educate you the best I can. I greatly appreciate you being here and please put this video on your social media site and explain that it is applicable. These are three very recent cases. Thanks for being here.